you want to? Okay. But, <laughs> you know, wow. We want to dance like David dance, amen? Amen.
Lord, for this purpose you brought us to this new place, this new building, Lord, that we could encounter you in a deeper and a better way. So, Lord, Lord, we thank you for your presence here. We know that you are here, and we are grateful and thank you in advance for what you're going to do and how you're going to show your glory. So thank you, Lord, and please stretch out your hand and bless us today. We thank you in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Go ahead and take a quick seat. Amen. Wow. God bless you all. <laughs> what happened to this side? It's like not a soul in the corner and then up there. Okay. Nice. Right, so welcome, everyone. Uh, we're in Pastor Kevin's now, again. So that's awesome. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Just before we do the announcements, there are just a couple of things that uh, I want to do. Um, uh, moving here was not a small thing. There were a lot of people involved in a lot of logistics uh, going back and forth to this school. And as you has been incredibly, incredibly accommodating. And actually, the school built the storage room there for us, for our purpose. So thank you, Lord, for, for what this school has done to encourage us to move here. Uh, it's really, really amazing. But there's one person in particular that I want to honor. Uh, Connor, can you stand up? Where are you at? Oh, yes, Connor. Give me a hand. God bless you, Connor. Connor, in particular, was back and forth with the school and just so many, so many amazing things that you know he had to go through. But he is the point man who I want to honor publicly and, and to bless you. The Lord we bless you for all the hard work that you put in, in particular for this. So, so thank you so much. Thank you. And, uh, and the other thing is, um, I want to call up Dr. Jacobs, if you can come up. Yes. Dr. Jacobs is one of our advisors, and, uh, and we would love to hear uh, you share just a few words for us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Well, it's great to be here. Uh, I don't know how many of you know me or how many of you have seen me in the last day or two. If I can just ask you again, could you just raise your hand how many first termers we have? Well, hopefully, maybe you don't remember my face, but maybe you remember my voice. Um, I am the provost of St. George's University, and I did the welcome to all the white coat ceremonies, so maybe you remember me, maybe you don't. That was yesterday, though. <laughs> So uh, this is actually one of the nice welcomes um, that I would like to do, and I appreciate the opportunity just to speak to you. You know, I, I speak a lot, um, and I do a lot of these kind of welcomes, but I always speak about what can happen at the university and where you should go and what you should do. You heard me yesterday. I won't be repetitive and say the same things. But this morning, I want to mention to you that being part of CSA is something very special. And that's something completely different. I know we have some parents here. I saw a lot of first termers raise their hands here. And I spoke a lot about it's special to be at the university. Yes, that's all true. But it's really special to be here. Because what you also show by being here, when you're young, you get sort of directed going to church. You go with your parents. Um, you keep on doing that. But yeah, you're on your own. Nobody's telling you to come here, except you have a desire to come here. And that's the cool thing. You know, I'm also far from home, and my family's all over the place. I miss them as well. I come here, I sit here, I think about them, I have that connection, I pray for them. And something else that I want to leave with you is, you will go through tough times. We all do. We're just human. But you know you always have God. And he'll be there for you whenever you need him. He's there for me. And boy, boy, I need him a lot. <laughs> I promise you. And keep that in mind. And at the end of the day, there's so many great verses that I could um, mention to you. But the one that always stands out for me is, I will never, no, never forsake nor leave you. Keep that in mind. It's great to see all of you. So glad the parents are you are here, 
and welcome to St. George's, welcome to CSA, and when you see me, greet me, tell me, I know you, I saw you in church. <laughs> in the back and t-shirts if you're interested. Um, the offering, we don't collect a formal offering or anything, um, and we know very few of us have incomes. <laughs> so truly, um, you know, just as a, as a support or anything, no pressure there. Um, we have t-shirts in the back for 30 EC. Awesome way to represent um, CSA. We try and wear them on Fridays. So Friday for CSA, we're in a class. The other thing is we have multiple Bible studies. If we want to click through these, this is on uh, Wednesdays. We have a uh, Bible study on yeah, Wednesdays with Leon and Adenia. Um, on the next slide, we have um, Friday Bible study with Priya. And then we have the men's and women's. All of this information is on our Facebook page. So feel free to go on CSA Facebook um, page in Grenada. And then we also have the SO Bible study. If you're an SO or interested, um, then that is on actually Tuesdays. They're uh, moving to Tuesdays. So do connect. Um, is Danielle or Ashley here? If they want to give away, um, Ashley's over there in the pink. Awesome. So meet with them. Um, they're the SO leaders, and it's an awesome time to connect. We have worship team auditions, which is really exciting. So this is tomorrow. If you are um, excited by worship, if you love worship, if you have uh, some kind of hidden talents that you don't necessarily always see at medical school, or vet school, whatever you're in, um, this is tomorrow. So it's 6.30. The song um, that you would want to practice and prepare is uh, the anthem by Planet Shakers. And so um, do come there. That is here in Patrick Adams, 6.30, um, and we'd love to, to do those auditions. Wednesday prayer at 12 um, by the down by the Belford Beach this is an amazing time to kind of get out of our comfort zones and do something um, midweek in the middle of your day on Wednesdays. It's a great time at 12 o'clock. CSA Kids, if we have any kids in the service, you guys can head up to the back up there. Um, we have CSA Kids, which is in Founders Annex. And so um, feel free to head there. It's an awesome time. Sometimes I'm like, I don't know CSA Kids. It's a great time. Awesome. So a few other things. We have um, our email sign up is at the back. If you're not on our email list, we'd love to send that out to you just to kind of a reminder of what's happening, where it's happening, and that's at the back. You can sign up. A great event is happening on Friday the 15th, and that is Worship at the Beach. So every year, um, every semester, we do Worship on the Beach, and that is um, at the Grand Ends Beach. If you walk through Umbrellas, just kind of the first thing you see there on the left. So go through in front of Umbrellas and to the left, and you'll see us. That is Friday the 15th at uh, 6 p.m. And so um, that's just a great time of worshiping and kind of finishing your school week, come out on Friday, it's an awesome time, Friday the 15th. And then we also have the first orphanage trip. Um, so our last announcement, so on this Saturday at 1.30, um, so the C CSA is connected with the local orphanage and they go and we um, connect with the, the kids and, and have fun and um, speak with them and, and bond, which is great. And that is 1.30 on the charter steps and a uh, really great time to, to kind of get out and volunteer and be into the kingdom. So wonderful, it is great to see you all. We are so excited to be here. And uh, thank you, Dave. Thank you. Amazing, wow, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff going on. Uh, so I know it's hard to commit to memory, but that's what our email sign-up is for. So uh, we're gonna have a, was that mentioned or maybe I forgot? We're gonna have a laptop at the back. And I think, Kara, where are you at? Where are you gonna put the laptop, where are you gonna put it? Back, back over there. Okay, so if you're not getting our CSA emails, which we send weekly, um, uh, find Kara. She's going to have her laptop in the back. Just type in your email and you'll be getting our regular emails. And also, you know, like our Facebook page too. Okay, um, so uh, now for the word. Um, so, our, yes, yes, come on up. Uh, so, uh, I have the honor and the privilege to introduce uh, uh, a man of God who is a big brother to me on the island here. He's been here for a while, he was undergrad in med, and uh, I love him so much, and 
looking forward to what he has to say. So uh, let's just give Leon a uh, round of applause. after they built this hall, and I remember the first semester that I started when we were, we were still in Bourne then, uh, the president of CSA at that time said I looked forward to the day where we outgrow Bourne and we moved to Patrick Adams, and I'm very happy that I'm here to see that. So, uh, and vote for it for us. So, uh, so, as you can see, you know, hopefully you don't strain your neck too much with your uh, We'll fix that for next week, but um, we're looking at, uh, you know, what does the Lord require? Um, you know, when we think about God, we think about goodness and uh, God being good. Um, but what about evil? And I know that seems kind of hard with, with that kind of, I just like to read something to you. Imagine it like this. Three generations of your family have lived in the same house, in the same town. They've struggled to raise a family, put kids through school, to feed them all. You have your friends and your family, and all of a sudden, you are told to leave all of it and walk out with a single suitcase. I remember the night of packing well. Things went in the suitcase, things were taken out of the suitcase. In the end, my mother filled it with food she had cooked and warm clothing and bedding. Then it was full. Plus, we took a watch, some earrings, a wedding ring, and some other things to exchange for food if necessary. The next day, my father was forced to hand over his remaining money to a delegation that included the mayor and the school principal as they rounded us up at the town hall. We had been absolutely unaware that of such a place as Auschwitz. It was a stunning reversal of the life we had had up until then. And I cannot emphasize enough how utterly scary it is to be at the mercy of your fellow people. Humans can't be evil, and I think that's not a shocking statement to make. When we read things like that, it seems a little bit shocking because it reminds us of the evil that exists. And then this is just one of the many stories of evil that existed then and still exists up to this day. And it doesn't take much to, to see that. You know, you look at the news, well, most people don't look at the news anymore, they look at Facebook. So you look at social media, <laughs> and you know, you you're bombarded by all the evil that is happening. And it's easy for us to get taken up with all the evil that is, that's occurring all day and say, wow, everybody's so evil, there's so much injustice. I'm from Trinidad, if you can tell by my accent, we're from Trinidad, yeah. So, um, Trinidad is, I don't know if you know, it's very close to Venezuela, it's less than 10 miles or something like that. Um, and you could see all the evil that is occurring in Venezuela right now. And it's so easy for us to say, Wow, that's, all of that is so much evil. But what about the evil in here? A lot of times we get taken up with all the evil on the outside um, and we forget the evil on the inside. And that's what I want to talk about today. Not the evils out in the world and why that happens. That's a, another conversation. We can have that another time. Um, but rather I want to talk about evils within our own heart. Um, some of their sources, not all of their sources, but some of their sources, I believe, um, from the Bible, and what should be your response to them? So what I'll call my title scripture passage is taken from Micah, uh, Micah chapter 6 actually. Now we won't be going into all the details of the book, uh, but just to give a little bit of a summary 
Uh, Micah is one of the minor prophetic books, and it's not minor because it's less important, it's minor just because it's smaller. Um, yeah. So uh, there are 12 of them, Micah is one of those, uh, maybe five big ones, Isaiah, Daniel, uh, Jeremiah is the last big one. Um, so um, Micah is addressing the Israelites, and the Israelites were God's people, they were, they were the chosen one. And he, like many of the, of the other prophets of the Old Testament, he was basically uh, pronouncing judgment on the people of God uh, of the coming destruction for not living according to God's law. And in chapter 6, verse 8, he makes a very profound statement. Uh, and, and you could turn it from, so this is Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He says, He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So the Lord through Micah is saying that these three things are good. Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly. So if we're talking about good, the opposite of good is bad or evil. So I think the, the opposite of that would be true for sources of evil. So injustice, lack of mercy or mercilessness, or cruelty, and pride. Uh, so you know, these are sources of evil in our lives when we don't do these things. So what I would like to do is go through each of these points um, and look at a different biblical story to, to explore what justice looks like and what mercy looks like and what humility looks like from the Bible. So, there go. Um, I'm, I'm excited. Anyways. So we're looking at uh, the first part where it says to do justice. Now we could preach a whole sermon series on what justice is. Um, but we won't do that today, and I won't keep you beyond, well, until um, five ish. I'll try. Uh, Proverbs 28 5 says that evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand it completely. So before we have any, any discussion on how to go about doing justice, we first need to understand what justice really is. Uh, but this is not the understanding of justice that the world has. It will, you know, we'll put a lot of you know, definitions of on justice, and, and none of those things are necessarily wrong, but they may not be the whole truth. Uh, so to really get at uh, the, the truth of justice, of God's justice, we obviously have to look at the Bible. Uh, when we think about justice from an everyday perspective, what do we think about? Anybody? I heard, I heard, I heard somebody say court. <laughs> And you just <laughs> skip those. I'll give you that. I can't throw hands. It's awful. Now this is why you answer my questions, right? With new ones. Um, I give a camera. So court system, very true. Now, and when we think about justice, that's what we think about. We think about like a legal system, and we think about punishment. So if somebody does something wrong or has something done wrong against them by someone else, um, and that could be anywhere on the spectrum from like petty theft to like rape and murder. Um, we want to execute justice on that person. That justice is some sort of punishment, and that punishment could be, again, a fine to somewhere all the way up to capital punishment, death. Um, justice in those situations, or in that view of justice, isn't you know isn't a bad thing. Justice being served in that context is a means of controlling or dealing with evil, and in a world full of evil like ours. That's just one of the means that we use to control and protect against that evil. But that view of justice is very limited. Um, it, only, it only speaks of one side to justice. So to a, one of the common words used for justice in the Old Testament is mishpat, and I'm sorry if I pronounce that wrong, it's M-I-S-H-P-A-T. Um, and that could be translated literally justice, or it could be translated as righteousness or right living. Um, and the most, the most basic meaning of this is to treat people equitably, to give a person what they do, regardless of their race, uh, nationality, social status, any of those things. It's giving people what they do, do but not in a punishment sense. Yes, you know, we should execute punishment equitably among all. If somebody does something wrong, it doesn't matter who you are, you should be punished the same. Um, but at the same time, it, this isn't always talked about in a negative sense. It's actually a lot of times talked about in a positive sense. So one context we often see the word uh, justice or mishpat used is in relation to particular groups of people, vulnerable groups. So widows, orphans, the poor, and immigrants, or foreigners. And the justice that they're referring to here is not punishment. They're actually talking about the opposite of that. They're actually talking about 
a generous, caring, loving side of justice. So to illustrate that clearer, we we'll look at a, the book of Amos. Now you have to turn there. Um, you probably should, just so you know where it is. Um, but uh, we won't be reading anything specifically from there. I'll just kind of go through the book as we go. So Amos, like I mentioned before, you know there were twelve minor prophetic books. This is one of those. So again, he's one of these prophets charging the Israelites for their um, uh, injustices that they're they're performing against the people. So the book starts off in chapters 1 and 2, announcing uh, So chapters 1 and 2, sorry about that. Um, starts off by announcing judgment on the people of God. Um, he's basically saying God is in supreme control and nobody is above his law. So he's talking to not just the law of you know, people of society or the lower class people. He's talking to everybody from the priests all the way up to the king. Everybody he's saying, all of you, God's judgment is coming upon you. And nobody is above that law. And then in chapters uh, 3 to 6, he kind of talks about the reasons for those judgments. What was happening in, in that day is the wealthy of the day were becoming complacent. The wealthy people were becoming complacent. They, they were rich. They had you know, all the luxuries, they actually talk about all the luxuries that they had, and these are not just, you know, a little bit of luxuries like, you know, like we think about today, like a, a nice car and a decent house. They had extravagant luxuries. But at the same time, while these luxuries, uh, they were enjoying these luxuries, it was at the expense of somebody else, and that, that somebody else was poor. The poor was suffering, and suffering to the point that they were being oppressed by the system. So the legal system that they had set up now was such that if you couldn't pay money for a bribe, or you couldn't pay money to do, get a favor done, then there was no justice for you. You would be um, taken advantage of. And that was, and that was basically the, the law that was set for themselves. Even food was so hard to come by uh, that the poor had to sell themselves into slavery. So these were the people that had no power in society, um, ended up being oppressed by, uh, by the powerful. And the rich, instead of helping them in the time of their need, exploited that vulnerability. Now technically, the rich weren't doing anything uncommon for that day. If, if I own all the food and you want food from me, then you should buy it. But if you can't afford that food, then you need to sell yourself to me in slavery. And that was common for that day. But the interesting thing is, God, even though that seems like a reasonable thing to make, because you know, you're making a purchase and you're buying it, God is saying that's not justice. He actually condemned them for that. He was saying they were, they were unjust for not being generous with, with the poor, with the widows, with the orphans, with the, uh, the immigrants, the foreigners that were in their land. The wealthy, the wealthy I mean, they had the power to help the poor, but they chose not to help them. Um, instead, they chose to help them in the way that would fill their own pockets, or the way that would benefit them most. And God saying, that's not justice. That's not the justice that, that I re require of you. God saying justice is having the power to do the right thing and doing it. And the, the, the crime committed by the Israelites at that point in time was they had the power to do the right thing, but they sought not to do it. They, they committed an injustice against them. So are there situations where we have the power to help and we choose not to? Um, and you know that could be anything. It could be a little bit of time, it could be a lot of time. It could be a little bit of money, it could be a lot of money. It could be anything in terms of, uh, in terms of resources that we have. A lot of times we think about helping others as charity, but charity implies that it's optional. If God is saying this is required, then it's not optional. It's not charity, this is a requirement. It is your requirement to give, it is your requirement to serve others. It's not, it's not one of the, you know, one of the nicer things we like to think of, because we like to feel good about, about giving, and we should. We should be happy and joyful about giving. But we shouldn't feel a false sense of pride and accomplishment because we give, because that's the standard. God told us that we have to. So whether we like it or not, or whether we want to or not, we should. We need to, because not doing so, again, could bring God's judgment. And I know uh, this might sound weird, but God gives us wealth for us to help those in need. And that might sound similar to some economic or political ideology, but this is not about socialism or any other isms. This is the Bible. It doesn't matter what 
it won't cause anything. This has nothing to do with politics. This has nothing to do with, you know, political affiliations, nothing like that. This is what the Bible says. The Bible says take care of them, and that's how we should take care of them. So uh, those are things I want to I want us to keep in mind. So, you know, more important than anything else, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that we show that we are children of God by caring for these people. So we said, we talked about, about justice, and we said justice is equitable treatment for all regardless of race, class, any of those things. Justice is everybody is treated equal because God made us all in his image and likeness. So uh, for one person to feel above or below another else goes against uh, God's law. That's why, uh, that's why racism in itself is against God's nature. But we won't go into that's a whole other discussion. All right, so moving on from justice, we talk about, uh, we'll talk about, oh, I, I will mention this. Justice is necessary for worship. I almost forgot, I didn't have it written down, I have it here. Um, the, if we go back to Micah, when he talks about justice, the, the verses before, I've read from verse eight, but if you read from uh, a couple of verses up from like verse four to verse six, God is saying, I don't care for your sacrifices. I don't care for your worship. I don't care for, you know, you could sacrifice your fullest born child. And he literally says that. I don't care about those things because you, you, know, you could do all these things, but you're not taking care of my people. And all this you're doing, all this worship that you're trying to give me is, is worthless. So justice is necessary for worship. And if we don't put the emphasis that God puts on it, then everything else that we try to do, all the other acts of worship that we try to do, becomes useless. So again, I just want to drive that point home. Justice in God's definition is of utmost importance. All right. So we'll move on to mercy, right? Um, so it says to love mercy. So previously we saw justice was giving people treatment that they deserve. Um, and, I, and that could be in a good, a good and a, a, or a positive and a negative way. Um, mercy, on the other hand, is giving treatment that people don't. Mercy is blessing in spite of people's undeserving nature. Mercy says, I know you did wrong, and it is within my power to execute some sort of judgment, but I will choose to love you instead. And I'd like to read a story that will illustrate that. His wife was gone. Sure, last night looked like a lot of nights recently. She walked out so many times before, but this was different. The abandonment, the adultery, the deception had mounted a massive assault on their marriage and family. Had it been three men in just six months, he feared there were more. Again and again, she'd wrecked the family's affairs with her own. She spent and overspent the family, family budget to please another man, another illicit, irrational, imaginary love. Their marriage, once sweet, had become a nightmare. Those first days, maybe even months of marital bliss felt so distant and unfamiliar. It was hard for her husband to believe that they were, they were ever even real. Two children, a son and a daughter, were the real victims, loved by their dad, left by their mom. They were conceived and raised in despair and misery. Their dad had always hoped things would change. He even promised that things would be different, that the loneliness and betrayal that they'd known their whole life would be filled for good, for hope, belonging, and love. Not knowing what to say to his confused and wounded children that night, dad knelt down between their beds and prayed, God, please rescue my bride the mother of my precious children, from this destructive suicide of her. She's left us for other lovers, believing that with them she'll find the protection and affection she craves. For as long as she runs from the promises we made and the family we built together, graciously cause her to be unsatisfied, empty and lonely. Maybe then in her despair and need, she would remember us, remember our family, and be the wife and mom again. If she would only come home, I would welcome her into my arms and heart as if it were a wedding day. I would love her as if we, were, we never lost her. Bring her home for the sake of your name. Amen. Several years later, on a hot afternoon in August, the husband was walking down through a local park. His oldest, a teenager now, had left an assignment on the kitchen table, so he was dropping it off at school. He could walk from his office and usually even enjoy the break and exercise but it was uncomfortable today. Temperatures had soared to record highs. 
leaving many people hiding inside late until late evening. He saw a woman, though, the only soul he'd see since he left work. She was exhausted, disheveled, and desperate. She was squeezing every last drop out of a public drinking fountain, clinging to it like she might drown if she let go. As he walked closer, he started to make out a face. Hannah, is that you? He looked into her eyes and he saw the face he knew so well, the woman who had hurt him so deeply. She was still his wife. She looked around uncomfortably, as if she was waiting for someone else to walk by and discover her shame. She had left so much for so very little. She left the provision, safety, intimacy of a truly good man for a treadmill of temporary pleasure and, and terrible destructive life choices. The other men always seemed so attractive, but they never truly loved her. And the relationships never lasted. Why are you out here, Hannah? I have nowhere else to go. I have had to get away from him. I'm tired, I'm scared, I'm thirsty. Come home, Hannah. You know I will always take care of you, whatever you need. I'll provide for you and protect you. You'll never be thirsty again. After several hard, awkward, silent moments, she finally looked back up at him, feeling lost, embarrassed, and ashamed. He was smiling. It wasn't the cute, naive, playful smile she saw on their first days together. No. It had been replaced with something deeper, more refined, durable. I love you, he said. She couldn't believe what she was seeing, what she was hearing. But you don't know what I've done, where I've been. No, I do. I know about the men. I know about the one at your apartment right now, and the others before. Come home. You don't understand. I'm not worthy of your love anymore. Hannah, I never loved you because you were worthy. I loved you because you were mine. And even though you ran away to leave yourself for others, I will dethrone you in my righteousness and justice. Even though you walked away from my love, I will dethrone you to me in steadfast love and mercy. Even though you defile our covenant and fulfill, fail to fulfill your promises, I will dethrone you to you in faithfulness. Some of you might find the story sounds familiar. This is just a modern day take on the story of Hosea. Uh, we won't go into the book and you know, reading the whole thing, but the story is, is basically about God was showing mercy to his people through the story of Hosea, uh, Hosea and, and that even when we are unfaithful and undeserving and un unworthy of God's love and his mercy, even in spite of that, and we should face judgment that God doesn't cast us aside and say, okay, you're gonna be destroyed because of your choices. The woman in the story made her choice. She left, she chose to be unfaithful. She chose to walk out. Her choices led her to the point where she was at at that point in time. She defiled the covenant, the covenant and as she rightfully said, she was unworthy. And he had every reason to cast judgment on her and say, no, you're not, you're not welcome back into this home anymore. But mercy is not excusing the wrong that someone else, else does. Mercy is acknowledging the, is acknowledging the, the wrong that, that someone commits and choosing to love in spite of that. Not choosing to cover it up and sugarcoat it, but choosing to love and help that person out of that destructive path, whatever that may be. This is the standard of mercy that God sets for us. Now, most of us won't be faced, I hope, with a situation like Hosea. That's a very, I, I can't imagine what that would be like. But in everyday life, in all everyday lives, do we show mercy? Do we choose to bless in spite of someone's undeserving nature? Maybe they commit some kind of wrong or sin against us. Do we choose to not excuse the wrong? Because that goes against justice. Justice lies, part of justice is acknowledging that wrong. Do we choose to acknowledge the wrong, but do we choose to love in spite of, and you hear me using that word choose a lot because it is not a natural thing. It is very unnatural for us to do that. We have to make a deliberate thing uh, to do that. So are we seeking to forgive in this situation? Mercy is often used with forgiveness. They're used in the same context many times. 
So are we willing to show mercy by showing forgiveness, or do we choose to execute judgment and justice by taking the justice into our own hands? <coughs> justice and, and mercy are often very difficult things to do. See, as Lewis said, everyone thinks forgiveness is a great idea until they have somebody to forgive. <laughs> and life is tough. Like, you know, I'm, sometimes it, it, it feels okay to say, you know, I'm, I'm right for feeling like this. I'm, I'm right for not wanting to show mercy. I'm wanting to, to, to cast judgment and bring justice for myself. Those are natural responses to life's challenges. As somebody in our Bible study this week, oh, this week, I want to say four times. <laughs> um, she said that it takes work to do the right thing, but sin doesn't take work. Sometimes it just comes so easy. Uh, but the standard is set. God, you know, in the psalmist he said, God's mercy is as high as the heavens above. And then Jesus in the New Testament is saying, be merciful just as your father is merciful. So if God's mercy is basically everlasting and you, know, you, you, can't, you can't limit it, and Jesus is saying we should be merciful in the same way, then that's a pretty high, high standard to have to live up to. So how being mere mortals, are we supposed to show ju justice and mercy just as our father in heaven is merciful? How do we become empowered to do that? And I think that comes from the last point uh, of the verse that we read before. If you go back to, to Micah, we said it was do justice, love mercy, and the last one, walk humbly. So for that, we'll use the greatest example of humility that has ever lived and ever will live, um, and that is Jesus. Um, and, I, and again, I wouldn't take any particular scripture for that, um, but I'd like to highlight a couple of things. Jesus is the best example of humility because he was God. He is God. He left his throne, he left heaven being God, just as much God, and sacrificed that all the glory that he was receiving, he was equal to the fa Father, the Bible says, in terms of glory. But he left his kingly form in heaven. Not to come to a kingly form on earth, but to come to earth as a peasant, basically. The lowest of society. He laid aside all his rights and privileges to be a servant of mankind. Isaiah 53, and if you if you like, you could turn there. I'll just highlight a couple. I have to go. It's supposed to be 50. Sorry. Um, it says that he was despised and rejected. It's not 53, by the way. 53. <laughs> He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, despised and we esteemed him not. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep before his shares is silent, so he opened not his mouth. This is the almighty God in human form, and he had the power when he was dying, or even before his death, to just say, you know what, I want this. This is, I am above this, I am God, like, you know, who are these? mere yeah, humans to, uh, to be doing this to me. But he didn't do that. What did he do? The Bible says he humbled himself to death, even the death on the cross. And that is true humility. Philippians 2, 4 to 8 says that, that Jesus humbled himself to death on the cross. And they said, using that same example of humility that Jesus had in service to us, we should have that same attitude of humility and service to others. Humility is saying, I might feel like I am above this, but I am not. I, I might feel like I don't need to, to do this, but God didn't need to do a whole lot of things that he did for us. So because he showed me his love and mercy, and he humbled himself. If God could humble himself, the epitome of royalty could humble himself to do the most humbling act of service, then who are we to say that we are above something? Jesus didn't die for himself and for his own gain. He died for, for us, for our sins. So acknowledging God's love and mercy towards us in our, our undeserving state should humble us. And that humility should show us, okay, well, now we should, we should administer that justice and mercy towards others that he calls us to have. To give them justice that as God would want them to give, not as we would want them to give. So my question is, what does your life say about you in these in terms of these three points justice mercy and humility can people see you doing justice 
and they see you loving mercy, and they see you walking humbly before and with your God. Amos, I really want to highlight the scripture here. Amos 3, 2, when God is calling out the Israelites, he's basically saying, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for your iniquities. He's saying, you are my people. I have a standard set for you because you call yourselves my people and I call you my people. So if you are called by my name, then there's a responsibility you have because you are in me. When God comes into our life and he enters by his Holy Spirit, there should be a change. And sometimes we forget that that change is supposed to bring about visible differences. Not just something on the inside. It's supposed to start on the inside. But it's supposed to be evident on the outside. How do, we, how do we talk? How do we interact? How do we act towards others? Does it reflect it? Does it reflect a life of justice, mercy, and humility? Or is it of injustice? cruelty and pride. Now there might be others here who you, maybe you never experienced that change. Or maybe, like me at different points in time, experienced that change but then allowed the cares of this life, like in the book of Amos, uh, the Israelites at one time they were worshippers of God, but then they allowed the cares of the life to, to overshadow that and nullify that change. To the point where it seemed like they were not different from the world around them. God wants to bring about that change in all of us, but he has to take first place in our lives before that can happen. He has to be the first priority before everything else because he will be the only one that can bring about that change, but he will only do that if you let him. We talked about justice at the start and the justice that we deserved was judgment for our sins. The Bible says that, says that all have sinned, all, regardless of how good we might like to think of ourselves at some point in time, uh, we have all sinned and we deserve that judgment and that justice that, uh, that really meant separation from God, which is another popular thing we like to talk about, but our eternity in hell. We don't like to talk about hell, but the Bible is very real about it. And it says that if you're separate from God, if you don't know him as Lord, then that is the judgment that we've basically chosen for ourselves by a life of sin. But instead of just leaving us in that judgment, what did God do? He showed us mercy. And his mercy was manifest through Jesus Christ. This was the epitome of love and mercy. He didn't forsake justice. Justice was still very real. But Jesus, instead of us facing that judgment and that justice, which would mean eternity separated from God, eternity in hell, he said, no, I will execute that just justice upon my only son. He died for us, for all of us, all of your sins, all of my sins, every sin that you have committed, every sin you will ever commit, he died for that. And Jesus received the justice that we should have out of his immense love and mercy for us. And he made that possible by humbling himself to the will of the Father. The will of the Father was that he would be crushed for our sins. So my question to you is, will you humble yourself to the will of the Father? 2 Peter 3, 9 says that he wills that none should perish, but that all would come to repentance. But you can't come to repentance pridefully. You can't come to it with a sense of entitlement. You have to come, come to it acknowledging that, Lord, I am submitting to you, and I am submitting to your will. I wish you could come up because I'm closing now. Uh, will you allow him to enter your life and to bring about the changes of justice and mercy and humility. The reality is we live in a very evil world and yes, there are a lot of evil, there's a lot of evil out there and there are so many things that we can't do and we can say about those people, but we can start with us. We can start with, with our world, our circle. Are we doing all that we can to bring about uh, changes, positive changes in terms of justice, mercy and humility? Or are we just going with the flow with everyday things and saying, okay, well, this is just how it is. God has set the standard for us, and he wants to allow us to manifest those changes in, in our lives, to show his glory. 
but you can only do that if you let it. And when we do let it, when the Holy Spirit comes in and enters, you may not be able to read it up there, but all those fruit represent the fruit of the Spirit. So what coming into our lives, what's humbling ourselves to Him, if we take root in justice, mercy, and humility, humbling ourselves to God, allowing His Holy Spirit to enter and control our lives, then all the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, you can sing out the whole thing if you want. You know, all those things that we like to talk about, those things become real fruit in our lives that people see. And those, those fruit bring about change. Love brings about change. The Bible doesn't say that, you know, punishment brings repentance. That says the goodness of God brings all men to repentance. And we need to show them that goodness, those who have it. And if you don't have it, I encourage you, humble yourself, submit yourself to God. God is not seeking to punish. God was seeking to punish us only then everything we do here would be worthless because we would have been dead already. But God sought to show his love for us by sending his only son. So we'll have some people up here at the front and at the back as well. If you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior, I implore you, come and pray with someone. We are not here to judge. Nobody's going to say, wow, you've never been a Christian. You've never received. God, no, this is why we're here. We're here for that purpose. And we've all done it at some point in time. That's why we could profess this good thing. Because he's brought about a change in us and is continuing to bring about a change in our lives. But we have to submit. So again, I ask, will you submit to him today? It, it, it's not a difficult thing to come to him, but we have to come to him in, in humility. Allowing him to bring about a change. And then everything else flows from there. I'm not saying everything else is easy from there, but it flows from that standpoint. Well, maybe you're not in that group, but maybe you do know him. But for some reason, those changes that we talk about, the change of heart that should bring about justice and love and humility, isn't as evident as you would like it to be. We all do know that at some point in time, from the highest leadership to the, you know, the most, you know, I don't know what's the opposite of that. But Everybody, everybody along the spectrum in, in God's church, we all have to face that at some point in time. We all have to humble ourselves and say, God, I want you to make me more like you. I want you to make me more like you in justice, so that my view of justice is not what the world says justice should be. My view of mercy is not what the world says mercy should be. My view of humility is not what the world says humility should be. So again, if that's you, whether, regardless of which one of those categories you fall into, if you'd like someone to pray with you for those things, or anything else for that matter. It could be anything at all. If you want someone to pray with you, we'll have people up at the front and at the back. Um, please come and pray with them. The Bible says that if we confess our sins one to another, he's faithful to forgive us. The Bible says to confess to each other because it brings healing. And you might not need healing in this year, but maybe you need healing in something else. Come and talk. Come and confess. Let us pray with you. Let us love you. Give you Christ everyone. Our Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you that in spite of our sin and our lives that deserved judgment and deserved hell, Lord, you chose in your love and your mercy, Lord, to send your son who humbled himself to death on the cross for our sins. Father, as we are all here today, Lord, I pray that you Call us by your spirit, Lord, to examine our hearts and examine our lives. See where we are not submitting to you, Lord. Where we are being prideful in some area. Lord, that we would not seek to please ourselves or even to please this world, Lord. But we seek to please you above all else. That we will see that you love us even in our sinful state, Lord. You love us so much that you're calling us out of that. So, Father, I pray for all of you people here today, Lord, that all of us, Lord, we will come to understand your love and your mercy and your justice more and more each day. That we will see Christ's act of humility as a standard for humility in our lives, Lord. And we will try to humble ourselves in service to one another daily, just as Christ humbled himself in service to us. Father, I pray that you fill us with your spirit, Lord, and your spirit will bear fruit in our lives, Lord, that we would show your love and we will show your joy and your peace and patience, kindness and goodness. But all these good fruit that you bring, Lord, that we will be able to show that and display that, not for all glory, Lord, but for your glory. And Father, we glorify you, Lord, that as you are lifted up, Lord, that you will draw all of us closer to you. And all those on the outside, Lord, that don't know you yet, you'll be drawn closer to you. 
So Father, again, we just thank you for your love. We thank you for your forgiveness. And we thank you for your spirit, Lord, that is working in and us, continuing to refine us.
again, if you're here and you need prayer, we still have people up at the front and the back that would love to pray with you. Don't feel like it's because the service is over that this ends. And even if you you don't want to pray with us right now, reach out to us. We're here. We're here to serve you. This is not about, you know, just a Sunday morning thing or even just a Bible study thing. Anytime, if you need uh, someone to walk with you, to pray with you, to be a friend. That's why we're here. We're here to serve each other. So please don't feel like you'll be putting somebody out by reaching out to one of us. Don't feel like you know we we are too busy for that. We're not. This is why this is why we serve to serve you and you serve us because we serve each other all the time. So as you go this week, I encourage you to seek to show God's love and His mercy. And as you seek to do that, He will pour in more of His love and His mercy and, and His justice. Continue to humble all of us before him. So, Father, as we leave this place today, we thank you for your spirit that is here. We thank you for your spirit that lives in and with us. And Lord, as we go throughout this week, Lord, I pray that nothing that uh, that we do would be displeasing to you, Lord. Lord, you said, Oh man, do you know what is good? You told us what is good. And Father, I pray that we strive to do what is good, Lord, just as your word calls us to, not by our own. 